Hello, everybody, and welcome to an overview of Chapter 6 in the Content Marketing Courseware. Today, we talk about podcasts and other audio content. Uh, if you can hear me clearly, that is because I am using a, a blue, it's called a blue microphone. That's the brand. And I recently picked one of these up a couple months ago because I knew I would be recording more lectures here. But it's also a great podcasting microphone. And that is the topic of our discussion today. Uh, this is a good video that you can listen to in the background while you're doing something else. Uh, there is a video component to this, of course. So we'll be going through the various sections of the content marketing chapter. But if there's one type, one, one week where you could consume all of the content as podcast, as a podcast, this is the one. This one's going to be a little bit longer. And I will try to address it as much as I can with as a podcast. You generally, with videos, you can see the cues, and there's uh, plenty of, of times when people will say, oh, if you look here, or if you'll see on the screen this, or people can even give fewer cues, fewer audio cues, because there's so many visual cues available. Think about watching sports. If you're watching sports on TV, uh, there will be many seconds, I'd say 10 to 15 seconds at a time where the announcers don't even have to say anything because you can see the action on the field or the court. Uh, I'm a big baseball and basketball guy. And I think about baseball firstly, because firstly, first off, because for a hundred years, baseball was solely broadcast through radio. And now if I'm watching my team playing, I'll see, I don't know, a good 10 to 15 seconds of dead air come by while there's some sort of action on the field. And that's because the announcers don't have to say anything that would only add to the chaos of the game at hand. Basketball is another prime example where on radio, every pass needs to be described. Every player needs to be scripted. Every action on the sideline, every call by the referee needs to be described. But if you are watching it on TV, you only have to say half those things. So today we are going to, I'm going to try to make this as podcasty as possible. And hopefully this will give you some inspiration for the content that you're creating that will somehow include or otherwise in, you know, involve the, uh, the, the audio content form that we're talking about here. So if we talk about audio, this is technically a chapter about audio, by the way, not just podcasting. Podcasting is the number one form of audio content that we see in marketing today, whether that be social media, um, websites, anything like that podcasts are number one. And if you have to think about podcasts going all the way back, you could technically say that the War of the Worlds from 1938 uh, was the first one. It was a radio broadcast. It was actually a production created by Orson Welles. And it was really just a show. There were credits at the beginning. There was Orson Welles coming onto the onto the microphone uh, initially at the beginning saying, Hey, okay, the it's Orson Welles playing this guy and this other, this woman playing this person. And so they see he's at the stage. So if you're listening to it like a podcast, that would make sense. Uh, and it would go on for several parts in, in it took place in New Jersey, small town. Um, and it was, it was based on a novel. Some of you may have seen the Tom Cruise movie on this, but because it was radio, people would be tuning in and out at random times when they're in their cars or at home, and they would suddenly think, oh, what's going on? There's an alien invasion, and it caused hysteria in that little town. It wasn't national chaos or anything, but it was enough to get plenty of videos made about him after the fact and all sorts of articles and a um, lot of lot of coverage that came out of it that ultimately ended up promoting the War of the Worlds book. But you talk about content marketing in the old days, this was definitely that. Now, 
if we fast forward to the first iteration of streaming, okay, I don't even know if I'd call this streaming, but there was internet radio. And um, I believe this was the, uh, the first thing that made Mark Cuban, in, a famous uh, judge on Shark Tank and owner of the Dallas Mavericks, this internet radio, satellite radio, that was his thing that got him famous, that got him his billions was he created a way to listen to the radio using the internet and not just radio waves. And as a result, we ended up with what we have today, Sirius XM satellite radio. You can play video radio on your computer, all sorts of different things. But if you wanted to go back to find the first internet radio show, it would be the show called uh, PFW in Progress, which was the New England Patriots show back in 2000. Strangely enough, Tom Brady was on the team then, just like he is now playing for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, podcasting it was a little bit different, and there's a, there's a couple core differences between these two types of uh, audio. Internet radio is something that is played over the internet, um, can be downloaded and listened to. A podcast is different. That's something that you are meant to subscribe to so that you get an alert every time that there's a new episode. And podcasting started um, with an IT piece um, by a tech pioneer that changed uh, names and ownership over the years for a couple of times. There is a different iteration of that show that's around today, but um, just like the New England Patriots one is obviously still around, but um, it is a little bit different. You know, podcasting back then, it wasn't the same where you could access all of your podcasts at your fingertips when you get in the car. Uh, no, this was something a little bit different and something that you would have to subscribe to by email. And back then you would get an email and um, from there you'd get alerts when things would happen. Now, as a content form that is consumed, podcasts are huge. It is um, massive. You think about it from a, a consumption point of view, 51% of the U.S. population has listened to a podcast. And strangely enough, 49% is actually done at home. Only 22% is done in the car. I found that a little interesting. I generally am the opposite. Um, and also, people generally listen to most or all of episodes when they set out to listen to them. So it's pretty interesting, and in, in the the number percentage of the U.S. population that has listened to podcasts every month has only grown year over year, from 2013 when you're just a little over 10 percent, all the way to 2019 and 2020 when you're looking at at least half the population today. Now, from a dollar side, you think about Joe Rogan is kind of the the banner child, the the poster child for making money with podcasts. He, um had he he got bought by not bought uh, spotify bought the exclusive rights to stream his podcast and he made millions on that and today uh, you know he's still as big as ever um spends a lot of time publishing content interviewing people and uh, his his controversies and political views aside he has made a ton of money podcasting certainly more than he ever made hosting nbc's fear factor back in the early 2000s now, let's think about podcasting in terms of the Ada funnel to go back to the old marketing lingo here. The, the Ada funnel is, it doesn't provide a really obvious spot for the podcast and for audio content in general. And when you think about the business case for a podcast, and this section of the chapter is pretty, uh, pretty intense you really do need to make a business case for the podcasting uh, medium. Most podcasts don't make it past a couple of episodes. There are millions of podcasts out there. If you go onto Spotify, you could be scrolling through podcasts for any industry, any niche for days. And chances are most of them are no longer around. A lot of podcasts um, that have been, that started even in the late 2010s, one of my favorites was called Reply All based back in, I think it started in 2015 or 16. Even they had to shut down recently after a controversy really set them back in 2020 or 2021. And next thing you know, 
they came back for like six months and they eventually just called it quits. Um, that was, I think what a lot of us, um, my, my, me and me as a self-proclaimed nerd and many others, we thought that was kind of the pinnacle of podcasting for a long time. They were run by Gimlet media, um, pod, a podcast network with a bunch of other shows. And it was really, it was a show about the internet and it was, it was great. I loved it. They gave me all sorts of laughs on my drive home from the office back in the day. Um, now today I listen to more niche podcasts. I'll listen to some from the ringer network, um, some about various TV shows. And it, it, it's interesting how you'll like watch a show, a binge really show, and then turn around and listen to a podcast about it. But, uh, nevertheless, podcasting, there's a business case for it, but you do need to figure out where it lives in the ADA, fun ADA funnel. And if you're going to make a business case for it and you're going to create it, not only do you need to plan out the podcast long in advance, but you need to think about how you're going to produce it at its most basic form a podcast can be done with two people a host and a producer and for me if i were to do a podcast i would be the host and the producer so i guess technically you could do it with one person but it's very time consuming doing it with one person and if you're ever going to bring on a guest or have any sort of variety of content that can be really time consuming as well um, from a business side it's highly recommended that there's at least two individuals. A lot of times the producer is somebody who is sitting opposite of the host, uh, is always on sound, checking to make sure that there's no loss of audio quality. Then afterwards goes into post-production and will edit it down, takes out the back channels, the stutters, the ums, uh, anything that could get the host in trouble and then ultimately posts it to the various channels like Spotify, uh, Apple Music, and everything else. Um, I won't talk about the Spotify-Apple battle today. Um, both of them have their merits. I use both, but that has also become something of uh, of vitriol over the past couple of years, which one is better to listen to a podcast. Now, if you also think about a business um, the business role and what podcasts can do. There's a couple. Uh, for one, podcasts can really help establish thought leadership. If people can start, will start listening. If you can develop an audience and a community with your podcast, you can really become a thought leader and a, a, an opinion leader for them. Secondly, you can do storytelling related to a product. And there's some really interesting ones that are out there. There's actually one, um, let's see if I can find, okay, we'll get to that eventually here. Um, there's a lot of great storytelling examples out there that relate directly to products. And um, the one that I have up on the screen here right now is actually from Norton Antivirus. And um, they have since changed their name after all of the stuff about the the Norton guy came out. Uh, but then you have more instructional podcasts. And that is something like what Neil Patel does and Eric Sue. They do really short little five, 10 minute tidbits about marketing best practices that you can employ with your business today. It's very, very insightful. I highly recommend checking it out. It's called Marketing School. And um, they've done like, oh, what, 1,700 of these. They're really fun little things. Um, they're very quick and there's um, if you're listening, if you're trying to listen to something for more than 10 minutes, this is not for you, but if you want something that'll get you, I don't know, around the corner to seven 11 or something, then this is the podcast for you. Then we have interviews um, actually lift like the ride sharing company created uh, a partnership with Gimlet. They have owned it to play all if you're keeping score at home. And these are the stories of the Lyft drivers out there in the world and how they are, um, you know, what they do other than Lyft and you know, what their plans are. And you get some really interesting stories. This one in particular um, is about a guy who is planning to own a restaurant one day. And it's really insightful and you get a lot of good, original, authentic stories. And something like an interview, is one where you can get that first person point of view in a podcast that you won't always get from, even from a video. In a video, sometimes if, if Lyft was going to do an interview series of YouTube videos, 
it would be overly produced. It would be inauthentic. And it would be clearly edited where the, the individual talking about their aspirations, just it seems like, okay, they're, we're not getting the whole story. You get this a lot with interviews where if you see like an athlete or a, a celebrity sit down for an interview, it's like, okay, am I really getting the full story here? Are they actually sharing what they think or is this just PR speak? Meanwhile, with podcasts, in by default, you don't feel that way. You feel like you're getting the raw, unabridged version of something. Now, maybe you are getting something edited, but you usually can't tell because with podcasting, it's all audio, so you can take words out and string sentences together much more flawlessly. However, when you think about an interview on a podcast, this is what makes Joe Rogan so popular and so famous, is that he's getting very authentic, raw, original emotion from the people that he's interviewing. And he gets a way to, he finds a way to cut to the core. This is what made Howard Stern so popular back in the nineties is that he wasn't really just like, you know, just not, just not just a shock jock, but he was somebody that knew how to ask the questions that could get to the latent motivations underneath the, uh, hard exterior that a lot of celebrities would uh, show to the greater world. And even today you have Howard Stern. That is, he has a, a serious channel. He actually has two serious XM channels and it's very much the same way. He brings celebrities in and celebrities are at this point, they go and sit down with him and they are ready to bear all it's on satellite radio. So they can, they can, they can swear, they can share raunchy stories and they know that they're not going to be censored for it. And because it's Howard Stern, he provide the host provides this kind of barrier where even if you do say something that might sound a little too risque or might not be fair, uh, you can use the host as a deflector shield where you don't actually have to get all of the, the blame for it. So it's easy to be more authentic and, and not be so careful with what you say. And again, this is the audio form coming to life being something uh, very, very powerful in there. I think there's something inherently powerful about just hearing somebody's voice speak than seeing them all dolled up, going through makeup, having three different lights on them and doing something that can often look painstakingly produced. Kind of like what we talked about with video, where at a certain at a certain level, production value has a diminishing returns. It's more of a bell curve, and it is not at all a um, you know. It, there's there's a certain tipping point there with production value, and the good thing with audio is that that doesn't really exist because there's nothing that you're looking at. It's much more intimate. You're listening to the people speaking. Now let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about planning a podcast. Everything starts with a microphone, similar to the one that I'm using here today. And in some recent surveys of podcasters, 70% of them say that top-notch audio quality is really important. I definitely don't have top-notch audio quality because the acoustics in my room are not uh, the best. You know, I don't, I don't have the classic podcasting training. I don't know. You know, I say that you're supposed to, I think it's like two to five inches away from the microphone. I don't know if I'm maintaining that the whole time. I don't even know if I'm sitting the right way. I'm just going here with what's going to be best for this lecture video slash podcast. But uh, in addition, you really need to make sure that people can clearly understand what you're saying, that there's no background noise, a consistent level volume, which I know I struggle with and making sure that there's no interference. So if I shuffle around in my chair here, you, know, you don't want that to be popping up, at least not on accident. Um, the editing process, of course, is important so that you can get rid of all those extra words and the long pauses that occur. A lot of uh, podcast hosts that you may be familiar with, if you ever meet them out in public, Chances are they're going to be very good at not saying those hums and ums and hums and you knows because they've gotten so much experience with it. Instead, you're going to just get a pause. And there's a couple of really good TikTok videos. I follow a guy who is a former radio host, and it is very bizarre watching him 
speak because you can tell when he is not speaking that he is he has essentially eliminated the filler words that exist and i can't do that at all i end up using even if i can intentionally remove the ums and the you knows i end up saying words like so and a lot of ands and a lot of transition words that i are very much done subconsciously a lot of times on radio too you'll have uh, radio hosts that just repeat themselves or they'll say they'll start a sentence and they'll say well today we're gonna talk about and then there's like a stop well today we're going to talk about the game of clue and i just said that because i'm looking at it here on the other side of my room it is tucked between a couple different board games and a drone for some reason which is really interesting when you think about how different speakers um, atone for the differences really it's something that just comes with time and there it is again i'm nowhere near that but it's something to consider I'm going to skip over a couple of these things here. Planning a podcast is important, but we don't need to go through the hosting element of it. But we do need to talk about integrating your podcast with other content. And this is going to be interesting because podcasts on social media is where it gets really interesting. Um, A podcast by itself doesn't really work there. And if you think about a podcast and how it also lives in a blog post, it doesn't usually work there either. That's where you need to start with a transcript and turn your podcast into words that you can then turn into a blog post like I will do with this one. And then you can turn around and optimize that for SEO and get some new traffic. Um, As I'm recording this, the uh, conviction of Adnan Syed, who was the focus of serial here, I got overturned. So this is especially very relevant here. Back in 2014, the This American Life author, Sarah Koenig, created a 9, 12, long series of podcast episodes called Serial. And it was um, a serial, like a series of episodes about this uh, case of a um, of an actual of an actual um, murder mystery. I don't know if I'd call it a mystery, but the this guy and then say I eventually got convicted, sent to prison for murdering his girlfriend, and it came out later. Clearly, as we found out today on Monday, that uh, there was more evidence and he could not be proven guilty. And so he was let go free after what, 20 years in prison. You can still listen to the whole series. I'm sure it's front and center today, but it is really fascinating. If you want to see kind of one of the first uh, really big mainstream breakthroughs in podcasting history, podcasts have been around for a long time, but it wasn't until 2014 that, that you saw a real big jump from that 12, 10 to 15% of the public listening to it to like 30 to 40% of the public listening to it. Um, the promotion of a podcast on social media, though, is really the fascinating part that I started talking about earlier. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it. On one hand, so you have like a tweet here, you can turn it into a video clip and put it against some waveforms, kind of like this. So if I were to press play, um, I don't think this will actually play, but it won't. No, it's just an image. Uh, the waveforms will move as the speakers talk. That's one way to do it. Um, another way, and I think this is covered more later on in the uh, social media chapters, you can also put it to an image. And uh, But my personal favorite way that I found was really useful is... You take that transcript that you created before and you put in the timestamps for the relevant conversations that people care about. This is something that sports podcasts have started doing a lot. And this is something that um, one of my favorite NBA follows has been doing. His name is Adrian Wojnarowski. He is the guy that is known for breaking news in uh, the NBA, one of the most famous to do it in all of pro sports. 
what he used to do is do, is publish a podcast each week, two weeks or whatever. And he would have various topics that he'd speak on. He wasn't going to be breaking really any news here, but he might interview some guests, some players, might speak on what he's been hearing, some rumblings, and he would go in and just in a word doc, but hey, at the 12, 12.04, um, LeBron James talks about where he's headed next. Suddenly, if you're a LeBron fan, you're like, oh my gosh, I need to listen to that. I don't need to listen to the first 12 minutes. I need to listen to minute 12. And then it might say on the next line of the word doc, at 19 minutes, Steph Curry sits down and talks Warriors playoff chances. Or Steph Curry was just, uh, I think he was um, covered in Rolling Stone. Steph Curry talks a controversial Rolling Stone interview. Oh, I want to listen to that. Let's jump forward to 19 minutes. It gives you, the podcaster, a platform to share elements of the podcast that people will not inherently see when you initially promote it. With a video, it's a little bit different because you can take screenshots and show those and promote them, take snippets and promote those too. With a podcast, it's not that easy. And so taking just a Word doc, writing out the most important moments that you know that your audience will want to see, or I should say hear, that's really helpful. And for somebody like Woj, uh, that's what he goes by, uh, to do that on his podcast probably skyrocketed. His, the success of his um, of his show. And there are other. There's another couple of examples from him specifically and how he's promoted his podcast on social media, either in this chapter or in other chapters as well. Really interesting ways that people can promote their podcast on social media. The Stukent example here is a good one as well, but there's there's many others. And the key to a successful podcast promotion on social media is not just what you're saying, but how you're saying it so that it stops people from doom scrolling. Because when it comes to Twitter and when it comes to Facebook, a podcast is going to be the hardest thing after text to get somebody to stop and consume your content. So that, I mean, there's other forms. We get to always talk about how you can record your podcast as a YouTube video or things like that, but um, we're going to keep moving. I do want to talk about some other forms of audio here. So podcasting is the dominant form. We've talked about that at at length here. But what about other audio? What about music? What about theme songs, jingles? Um, Weezer, the band, they did a cover of the State Farm Like a Good Neighbor, State Farm is There song back in the day. I had never heard it until I started researching this chapter. And did you know that they've done that? Uh, I don't know if it worked. I don't know if it achieved what they were trying to do, but that's an example. Um, Another example is music set to videos as a secondary supplementary type of content. And the video I embedded in the text, if you are into sports at all, You've got to watch this video if you have not. I remember it as a almost teenager when this was originally published. ESPN put Aerosmith's dream on to highlights of all sports up through the year 1999. And they first played it on New Year's Eve before 2000 when the ball dropped. And it was at the time as a child, one of the most bone chilling videos I've ever watched. It was amazing seeing just you know, the whole world of sports coming together in four minutes. And in the 22 years since then, every time I hear Dream On by Aerosmith, I think of this video. That is the power of music being in audio, being set uh, with other forms of content, if done correctly. A couple more creative ones. I am a big fan of the playlist. (laughs) Um, You may have seen some screenshots or some Spotify playlists where the titles of the songs create a message. Uh, A great example of this is on LinkedIn. You see them a lot actually with marketing messages right now and how um, certain social media tasks are are too challenging or something. Uh, You could just check up, look up clever Spotify playlist titles and you'll see some of what I mean. The the idea behind this is that there's enough music on Spotify now where 
um, any word that you want to find and put into a playlist, it's there and you can find it. The qu- it just becomes a question of, um, is it the right form of the word? and Will it fit what you're looking to do? I was going to do one of those specifically for this lecture and post it. I still might, but it's something that um, just takes a little bit of time to do. Um, so now I want to move on to um, kind of one of my my other things. And also another word in the playlist. Um, one example is what KFC France did. This is an embedded playlist into the chapter. They played um, music that they were going to try to play in their restaurant. And they called them uh, bucket bangers. So if you want to check that out, you can do that as well. Speaking of music and food, you can talk about original music all that you want, but there's something that, um, one that you really need to look up is how Hamburger Helper created their own album and put it out on uh, SoundCloud back in the day. This was massive in 2016, at least for, for my audience for people like me um so originally as an april fool's joke in 2016 hamburger helper claimed that they were going to release a whole album on on soundcloud they got a bunch of b and c list hip-hop artists and rappers from la and they put them together into an album called watch the stove similar to watch the throne which is the jay-z and kanye uh collaboration album a few years earlier like four years earlier and it's several, I mean, I can't play them, but they all, they, cause they're dirty, but it had almost, it had more than 5 million listens, like within a couple of weeks. And if you go back now, the, the um, SoundCloud playlist is embedded in the chapter. Some of them have over 10 million views and list, or 10 million listens. And the, the content that came out of this and just the sheer brand awareness for Hamburger Helper was unlike anything you could have ever imagined. It's still unclear, and it probably will always be unclear, what the uh, monetization strategy was behind that. And I think it was largely an accident because it was very cheap to make. They weren't using any big names, but the music was actually very high quality, very funny, and it got people buzzing for weeks. And again, there's 10 million listens on a couple of these songs. It was something that was really fascinating. And and one thing the article that I found about it said that the brand was facing fast declining sales, but still maintain their well-known mascot glove. And they still had a large social media following. So then they introduced something out of the ordinary and they went viral and the brand became relevant yet again. So that is my... um, Probably my favorite, I mean, outside of the podcast stuff, this is my favorite example is the idea of the Hamburger Helper um, album and how it was so popular, especially on social media for for weeks. I mean, they would play samples of songs. They created some videos with them. You saw the glove dancing. And then a couple years later, the glove did a Christmas song with Little John. Like, it got really out of control eventually. It was, um, but it was hilarious. And it's, Again, it's content marketing at its finest and most creative. Uh, now, audiobooks, a lot of people have listened to books on tape or audiobooks. Now, I don't really see a great brand con- connection for this, but it's there. If you had a book for some reason that uh, from your brand, you could do an audiobook. I could do an audiobook for my content marketing textbook. Nobody would buy it, but it's an option. Uh, And then finally, there's social audio. This was the clubhouse and the Twitter spaces phenomenon of the early pandemic that has started to cool in uh, recent months. It's funny because when I first set out to write my content marketing textbook, the initial thought I had is, is clubhouse going to need its own chapter? And we're no, it'll get, it'll at least get its own section in the podcasting chapter, right? Well, now it's got four paragraphs. Actually, Clubhouse itself has one paragraph and the larger form of social audio has four paragraphs where um, the general idea here is that it was, it's been a rise and fall. It, it had its time in the sun. Uh, it hit at the perfect time in the middle of the pandemic when most people were working from home and they wanted some sense of community. 
Additionally, with Clubhouse, there were some advantages there where you could jump into a room, a marketing room, best practices room, just turn it down the volume and occasionally listen in to hear what's going on and try to butt in and, and make some connections. There was some legitimate value for a while. However, the two big things that set Clubhouse back is one, it was only available on the iPhone. So anybody that had an Android uh, device could not use it. And two, there was no growth strategy. There was no way to adjust. And that was a big problem because after about three or four months, after it climbed so fast and became so popular, uh, it just kind of remained stagnant. There were some incremental improvements made to the application, but the idea of social audio in itself was kind of a dead end idea. Now, Twitter has done a good job of integrating it into the larger Twitter application. I will say that. It is something that I do occasionally check out. And Clubhouse itself still does maintain some users. However, social audio itself as a form is at a crossroads. It does maintain the authentic elements that we talked about earlier and how podcasting can make you feel like you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And you don't have to worry about the video side where on a Zoom call or on a Teams call, you're preparing yourself and you think you all you have to be look 100%, get ready to go. But unfortunately, the level of commitment required for the user and, and the unique value proposition of the social audio form just isn't there. It just does not exist in such a way that the simplicities and the implicit and the ability to just quickly scroll through stuff on uh, video, on TikTok, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, those, those are all content forms that aren't live, not usually, and it's not something that you have to be an active participant in. Not saying you have to be an active participant in Clubhouse, but it encourages it. And you also don't know what's going to be going on, and sometimes the content isn't great. There's no way to go viral on Clubhouse, so you don't know what's going well, and there is not the interpersonal friendly uh, relationships always. A lot of times you end up with strangers. Twitter is able to circumvent that a little bit, given Twitter spaces. And I have seen some recently that have done really well at bringing together communities. And Reddit is doing something similar. Reddit Live, where they're bringing in something similar. They're utilizing social audio, where people that are a part of a certain Reddit subreddit can come together and have a discussion at certain times of day. I've only done that once. It seemed pretty cool, but um, I know that is largely still in the beta phase as well. Now let's move on to the last section. That's audio in a content marketing strategy. This is not a long section. And again, there are no images. So if you are logging into the courseware to read it, it's just text and I'm sorry about that. However, um, I do want to go back to the music thing and audio in general in that it may, in past chapters, I have talked about how visual content, visual people are visual learners first and foremost. And video or visual content is inherent in video. It's inherent in um, visuals. Actually, visuals are coming up next, but um, visual content is also kind of an element of written content when you just see the way that uh, user design is is utilized in terms of like spacing, headlines, the word choice, things like that. With audio, you can just sit back and listen. And there is absolutely a form of intimacy there that does not exist in other forms. Another thing that I like to talk about, though, is, is how music really takes it to another level. Think about, if you think about a song from 10 or 15 years ago, it, you're going to connect it to a memory or how you, when you first heard it, or you're going to have some memory of when you heard that song and you were doing something. And that is something, that is a connection that the other content forms don't have. And it's like me with the Aero, Aerosmith Dream On. I remember where I was. I remember who I was with and how it was played. I was at my neighbor's house at the end of the street watching a rerun of Sports Center from New Year's Eve because it was New Year's Day when I saw it. And they had the old TiVo set up and they, they rewound it just to show me that video. And I saw it for the first time. And I, I vividly remember the entire scene. And... It's not that like I was trying to remember it forever, like, oh, this is a monumental moment. But 
remember Linda Cohn was the host for Sports Center that day, and she said Aerosmith has never sounded so good, and then it went into the video and the song. That is not something that would have happened if not for that song. Even if you played all the all the highlights to another song, sure, maybe that I could have gotten that evoked that emotion with another song and remembered something else and got nostalgic. But it's something that simply uh, doesn't happen without the side of music that that is part of it. The same, I mean, I could think of dozens of other songs from the '90s and the 2000s where that's that same situation occurs. So many memories are brought back thanks to music and to other audio forms. So it's really important that you can utilize that in a content marketing strategy because that's going to be a connection that you can make between your brand and the target audience that the other content form simply cannot do. It's usually not audio by itself. Yes, podcasts can have a, a role in that and they can, they can churn some of that going. But that nostalgia feel that's done by music first and foremost. And that is something that you need to do. Um, they need to think really intentionally about because you need to think about the audience, who's going to like this kind of music, who's going to recognize the song. If it's a popular one, if it's an original song or a jingle like hamburger helper or what Weezer did, it's gotta be something completely different and it's gotta have a whole strategy around it in itself. So, um, that wraps up audio and I, I hope that you have enjoyed this podcast form of content. I have gotten into the habit recently of breaking up chapters into multiple segments, but today I wanted to make this more of a podcast and podcasts are generally a little bit longer and they are kind of the free flowing speaking. You'll notice if you watch the video, there wasn't a ton of video support here because this is not a chapter with a ton of visuals. It is more audio based. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any feedback on my podcast performance. Again, I'm not going to edit this. I'm just going to post it straight. Or if you have any questions about podcasting or want to get involved at all, please feel free to reach out. Um, this has been a joy to record. And I know um, I've been able to speak a little bit more candidly on the topic of podcasting and audio content at large. Whereas on the other chapters, it's a little bit more structured and um, based on the content that I had in front of me. So I hope you enjoyed this today, and until next time, um, thank you for uh, stopping by and, and checking in.